50 dead, 50 innocent souls inside a nightclub here. And so many families with no idea yet if their children are among them. It's terrible. He's my only child. Authorities say a lone wolf is responsible. A 29-year-old American who had been interviewed before by the FBI. A gunman with a brand new rifle, a handgun, and a 911 call in the middle of the massacre, pledging himself to ISIS. And out of nowhere, I just hear, Brrr. They're reporting shots fired. He said he was going to die and he loved me. That's the last thing I heard. What happened to the hostages in the hours before they broke through the wall? Heroic moments as they stopped to save the wounded. I took off my shirt and told him, hey, I got to stop the bleeding. We speak with the woman who may have known the shooter best, his ex-wife. The president calling this an act of terror, an act of hate. But outside that Orlando nightclub today, hundreds of blood donors lining up with love and defiance. We will not be stuck in our homes. We will not go back into closets. Tonight, major questions for the FBI. How did a man they interviewed three times make it to this moment in Orlando? Look at that, they're shooting back and forth. We're on this earth for such a short time. Let's try to get rid of the hatred and the violence, please. A special edition of 2020 starts now. Good evening and welcome to our special edition of 2020. I'm Elizabeth Vargas in New York and we are once again a nation coming to grips with an act of terror, a peaceful Sunday morning shattered for all of us by the news coming out of Orlando of the worst mass shooting in U.S. history. My colleague David Muir is right there tonight. David, what's the latest? Elizabeth, good evening, and I am here tonight, the nightclub right over my shoulder. At this hour, you can still see a heavy police presence here, and just beyond the sign over my shoulder here, that is the sign for the club, and we've been told that at this hour, Elizabeth, they have begun to remove some of the bodies. So many young lives cut short here, and as we mentioned, the president calling this an act of terror and an act of hate, and when you hear the stories here tonight, the young man who texted his mother saying, I'm going to die, some trapped in the bathroom, then a young survivor who now talks about playing dead for three hours while the gunman asked questions of people inside that club and shouted, stop killing ISIS. It's chilling to think that so many of the young people were just getting here last night, 24 hours ago. Many had not even arrived yet. And then later, as that music was booming, the gunshots began to break through it all. It is Latin night at The Pulse, a gay nightclub in downtown Orlando, packed with 320 people. And this video of people dancing taken just last night and then at 2.02 a.m., bartenders announcing last call when suddenly the gunfire. You could start smelling the ammunition in the air. Like it smelled like fire. Was your instinct to hit the ground? I just wanted to get as low to the floor as I could and try to crawl into safety. As that gunfire erupted, you could hear it from the outside. <laughs> Oh my God, they're all shooting back and forth. Our officer uh, engaged in a gun battle with that suspect. Uh, the suspect at some point went back in, inside the club where more shots were fired. You see people screaming and falling and there was blood everywhere. The nightclub has three main areas, the hip hop room, the main bar with the dance floor and a patio area. Some people escaping out this side door and into this small alleyway. Jean Yell telling me he crawled on the floor, reaching through the curtains to find a sliver of an exit, but that people were climbing over one another to get out. Um, people were jumping over you? Trying people to get were out? trying to jump over me, like pushing my head down, like it's, it's a state of panic, like we just wanted to get out. Another survivor, Joshua, telling us how he hid under an SUV, discovering a survivor who'd been shot in both arms and in the back. He took off his shirt and used it as a tourniquet. I took my shirt off, I tied it as high as I could over the first wound. Um, second one, I took his shirt, tied it over that one. Um, thought he was okay. I kind of like held him over, like my, his arm over my shoulder, and vice versa. No ambulance is left. Police told him to get in the back of the cruiser and to give the man a bear hug. 2.08 a.m. and the Pulse nightclub posts this on Facebook. Everyone get out of Pulse and keep running. But inside, the frantic scene continues. So many looking for the exits, others hiding in rooms with no way out. I saw him. He was maybe 20, 30 feet away from me. 
and I saw the fire coming out of his gun every time he shot fire. About 15, 20 people got shoved into a one-person bathroom until he started shooting through the doorway. Dozens who did not make it out, becoming hostages, stuck inside. Some huddled inside a bathroom, just off the dance floor, texting loved ones. Call police, I'm going to die. He called him a terrorist, has them in the women bathroom, and please come get us out because he's about to kill us. And in the midst of the attack, the killer himself. Authorities say he called 911 to pledge his allegiance to the terror group ISIS. Authorities sending armored vehicles and SWAT teams, they rushed to the scene. But for nearly three hours, they hold their fire, waiting outside. We're being told possibly up to uh, 15 remaining in the club that are barricaded in. Why did the SWAT team wait three hours? In that time, we need to set up, reevaluate, re reassess what's, what's happening, and make sure that all the pieces are in place. And Around right 5 a.m., explosions oh, at the club. Some sort of uh, ex explosion or. Moments or some later, sort of we learn it's a controlled not, explosion sure set off by police to distract the gunmen. An armored vehicle smashes through a wall of the club, and SWAT officers swarm in behind. Look at that, they're shooting back. Eleven of them suddenly involved in a shootout with the killer. I, we had 11 Orlando police officers uh, that exchanged gunfire with the suspect and killed him. Authorities say the shooter revealed to be 29-year-old Omar Mateen, a U.S. citizen born in America with Afghani parents. Police say he used two guns, authorities revealing he purchased both of them in recent days. It was a handgun and an AR-15 type assault rifle. One round injuring an officer during the firefight, this damaged Kevlar helmet may have saved his life. And it is with great sadness that I share we have not 20 but 50 casualties. In addition to the shooter, there are another 53 that are hospitalized. Making this because the deadliest the mass shooting in U.S. history. Although it's still early in the investigation, we know enough to say that this was an act of terror and an act of hate. The 15th time President Obama has addressed the nation since taking office after a mass shooting on U.S. soil. We do have an ABC News exclusive here tonight as we now get a new portrait of what it was like inside that nightclub as the gunman asked people their racial backgrounds, began talking about ISIS and holding them essentially hostage for several hours. This one survivor you're about to hear the tale of was in there for three hours as SWAT teams was, were assembling right outside here before they broke through those walls. And Gio Benitez talked to him a short time ago as he was leaving the hospital tonight. Gio is across town here in Orlando. Gio? That's right, David. We are at the largest gay club in Orlando, and this is where we met that survivor. He played dead for three hours and was just released from the hospital. In fact, he's still wearing those hospital ID tags. Listen in. Uh, he heard them on the, um, you know, talking probably to the police department or texting, and he asked them, please do not text. And so they stopped, but then somebody started the texting back up again, and he said, didn't I say don't text? Give me all your phones. Who's in here? Are you guys black? And a couple of them said, yeah. He said that I don't have an issue with the blacks. And then he got on the phone. I don't know if it was with the news or, or the uh, police department telling them that to stop, America needs to stop bombing ISIS. So Syria. he was calling people on the phone? Yeah, he called somebody on the phone. And he was telling them stop bombing ISIS? Stop bombing ISIS on the, uh, in Syria. Then he called somebody else that he knew, and he mentioned that uh, that he was the fourth shooter, and there was three others, and he mentioned, I believe, a female name, and that was playing dead, or, you know, because he's saying that she, she has a bombing vest, and he has one too. And then he said there were three snipers out there uh, waiting for cops to come so the snipers would shoot at the cops. So this whole time, what were you doing? I mean, you must have heard all this gunfire. Yeah. Uh, I stood quiet. You know, I said, I don't think he knew we were there until he came back in and shot again. And one black boy came crawling underneath the stall, grasping our legs and, and having me and my friend to drop to the floor. And he would go wash his hands and use the hair, the, the, the blower. And I felt something poke the back of my pocket. You think he was poking I, you? Yeah, one, it was like one quick touch or poke. I don't know if he was with the, I didn't know what he had to use as a weapon, but he probably was thinking of, you know, I'm dead. <laughs> so you played dead for yeah, three hours yes, straight. Yes, and my friend followed the role, you know, quiet. I heard the cops screaming, get down, get down. 
It looked like they were getting closer. I don't know, they pulled people from the other side of the, of the club there out. He was busy fixing his rifle, or I don't know what he had, but he was busy clicking, fixing. I heard shells drop, you know, shells dropping on the floor. And he was happy that he got it fixed, and he said, oh, I got, I got a, plenty of bullets. He said, I've got plenty of Plenty bullets. of extra bullets. He started shooting in the stall, and I don't know if he was killing the ones in the back stall, and the cops bust a hole in the wall. What did you see when you walked through that club? No, I did and not. He says, I, he they said, took me out of the hole in the wall. And he says that he is a mentor to a lot of the young people in this community. He says he knew 75% of the people in that club, especially all of those who died. David. Chilling to still see that hospital band around his wrist, Gio. We're glad he's okay. So many of the shooting victims were taken to the region's primary trauma center, which fortunately is just three blocks from the nightclub. And I wanted to show you an image tonight of the gurneys lined up outside that hospital at the ready because they knew there were so many victims from inside the nightclub. This evening, so many families and friends still waiting for word about their loved ones. It's been an excruciating wait all day today. And ABC anchor Amy Robach is at the hospital with that part of the story tonight. Amy, what more do we know about the victims there? Well, David, we can tell you that 44 people were rushed to this hospital in the hours after that deadly shooting. We know one has since been released, but nine others died on their way to the hospital. And just to give you an idea of the scope of what these medical professionals are facing today, doctors performed 26 surgeries here today alone at this hospital. And hanging in the balance of all of this confusion and chaos are the families of those who are still missing. They are literally in limbo. Their names, not on anyone's list. For most of the day, there were only numbers, 50 dead, 53 injured. But tonight there are the names and faces to go along with the stories of so many people who ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. These names now included on the official death toll. Kim Morris, 37 years old. Luis Omar Ocasio Capo, 20 years old and Juan Ramon Guerrero, 22 years old, who was there with his boyfriend. Dozens more lucky enough to survive, like Rodney Sumter, a bartender at the club and father of two, and Josh McGill, who stopped to help him. I kind of grabbed him and pulled him over to me. He was like, hey man, I think I got shot. I took off my shirt and told him, hey, I got to stop the bleeding. I tied um, the first gunshot wound around his arm with my shirt. Jillian Amador, just out of the hospital, she was on the dance floor when the gunman opened fire, trampled as she tried to escape. Her friend, Jeanette McCoy, helping triage victims in the minutes after the shooting. I was okay besides the regular bumps and bruises and my only instinct was to help everybody else around me. But there are the countless others still unaccounted for tonight. Like Jeff Rodriguez, he sent his brother a text from the chaos saying he was bleeding. The last text said, uh, I got shot, I'm bleeding out, I think I'm dying, I love you guys, tell mom, dad, everyone I said I love them. Tonight, so many families of those still missing are gathered here at Beardall Senior Center, just blocks from the crime scene, where authorities have the grim task of notifying next of kin about whether their loved ones survived, like Baron Serrano, who is still waiting to hear the fate of his brother Juan. How important is hope to you right now in this moment? He's, he's the main thing. He's the only reason why I'm standing and, and I'm facing the press and, and everybody and answering all the calls because people are right now expecting the worst, not me. I know, I know he's out there. Barone told me that he visited the hospital three times today, searching for his brother amid the chaos. And in fact, just a few moments ago, David, I saw him back here again for a fourth time. He says he has to be strong for the rest of his family, which is literally falling apart at this hour, not knowing the not knowing so excruciating for hundreds of family members and friends of people who are missing at this hour, David. The entire country is uh, feeling this with them, Amy. Amy Robach on the scene at the hospital, and she'll be here through uh, the morning on Good Morning America. I want to get to Joshua McGill because you spent some time over at the hospital yourself today. I want to let everyone know at home that, Joshua, you're 26. You were inside that nightclub. Yes. You got out, and you were telling me that you crawled underneath an SUV. Correct. For safety. Uh, I was actually trying to run for it and heard some more gunshots and kind of just dodged and ducked and kind of hid behind an SUV, crawled a little underneath it to kind of hide myself, 
Um, when I heard the gunshots further away, I then crept out to run for it again, and that's when I noticed uh, the victim. Someone who needed help. Someone needed help. And you were saying they'd been shot a number of times. Yes. At first, I just saw a lot of blood. I didn't know what exactly from. Um, when I got to him and noticed he had been shot on once on each arm, and then later on found out another time on his shoulder. He was dazed a bit. He, he, was, he was, wasn't sure if he'd been shot. He said, I think I've been shot. He said, yeah, he said he, he thinks he's been shot, uh, so I assume he was in shock. Um, I let him know that I'm here. I will be here to help you. I will do whatever I can. I need to stop the bleeding. Um, do you mind? And, and he just was like kind of out of it. So I took my shirt off, used it as a tourniquet to cut off the circulation to stop the bleeding. Um, took off his shirt, did the same thing to the opposite arm. And I know there were uh, ambulances had all gone to the, the hospital. There were none left. Not. And so the police told you to get in the back of a cruiser? Yes. Um, when we finally got to a safety zone, the officer told me uh, there were no ambulance to be dispatched, but we will be transported in the back of a cruiser. And they gave you instructions? The instructions that they gave me were pretty simple. Um, one was, I'm going to lay down on my back in the back of the seat. He's going to lay on top of me. I'm going to apply as much pressure to his, the wound on his back and hold him at, on the way to the ER. I did that, um, and while we're, yeah. Yeah, we began talking to him, uh, the officers were saying, keep talking to him, keep him conscious. That's when I got his name, it's Rodney, uh, age, where he's from, etc. I told him, everything's gonna be okay. Um, I got you, I did everything I can, you know, stop the bleeding. Um, I asked him if he was religious. Uh, I said, I don't know if you are, but I'm gonna say a prayer. And I just, you know, Mainly, I was praying that I didn't, I wouldn't break my promise. That um, he was going to be okay. Yeah, that he was going to be okay. And I told him, you know, I just said, basically a prayer. You know, you're fine. You're, you're going to be okay. We're on the way to ER. And I mean, I'm pretty sure he mumbled, "Amen." Uh, I learned earlier today when I went to the hospital um, because I am still concerned that he was stable and that um, some of the family members I also learned have been able to go in and see him. So he's doing okay and then we're hoping to actually meet with him tomorrow. Because of those tourniquets and the, the hug in the back of the cruiser and the prayers on the way to the hospital. You got it. All right, Joshua, we're glad you're okay. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. 26 year old Joshua McGill yes. who helped to save one of the people inside that club, Elizabeth. What an extraordinary story, David. My goodness, what presence of mind that young man showed. We are, meanwhile, starting to get a clearer picture of the shooter, the man who caused the worst shooting, the worst massacre on U.S. soil. Omar Mateen is his name. He was an American citizen known to the FBI, and according to his ex-wife, he was an abusive man with possible mental health issues. ABC's chief investigative correspondent, Brian Ross, is here. And Brian, you have an exclusive interview with this woman. You tracked her down found her and spoke to her. We hear from her tonight. That's right. And long before today, Omar Mateen was a man described as unhinged, homophobic, violent, and prepared to kill. He's also someone well known to the FBI. But what's not clear tonight is precisely what triggered his deadly assault. I honestly say that this was a sick person. This was a sick person that was really confused and went crazy. This is Omar Mateen's ex-wife, Satora Yousefi, a woman who told ABC News tonight her former husband was a man with hatreds buried deep. He would be perfectly normal and happy, joking, laughing one minute, and then next minute his temper, and he would be like, his body would just totally opposite, you know, angered and emotional and violent. And that later evolved to abuse. Mateen was an American citizen born in New York who attended high school in Stewart, Florida. He worked as a security guard for the last nine years, posting this picture of himself wearing an NYPD t-shirt. He really loved the police department. He worked as a as a correctional officer or a guard at the Juvenile Delinquent Center. And a lot of his friends, like I said, were from the police department in Fort St. Lucie or Fort Pierce. And he, you know, I believe he applied to the academy and was trying to become a police officer. Oh, my God. His job had been to protect lives, but today he took lives. As the FBI responded in the early morning hours to the crime scene, agents quickly recognized the name of the shooter. 
It turns out the 29-year-old Mateen was well-known to the FBI counterterrorism squad. He was interviewed by FBI agents three times over the last three years, after he allegedly told co-workers he had ties to known terrorists, the first time in 2013. The FBI thoroughly investigated the matter, including interviews of witnesses, physical surveillance, and records checks. In the course of the investigation, Mateen was interviewed twice. Ultimately, we were unable to verify the substance of his comments, and the investigation was closed. But then one year later, in 2014, Mateen was linked to this Florida man who went to Syria and became a terrorist suicide bomber. We determined that contact was minimal and did not constitute a substantive relationship or a threat at that time. There were no criminal charges and nothing on his record to block his purchase of the two guns he used in the shooting, a Glock pistol and an assault rifle like these. So he can legally walk into a gun dealership and acquire and purchase firearms. He did so, and he did so within the last week or so. What agents don't yet know tonight is why he targeted the Pulse nightclub and why he did it on this day. Federal authorities say as Mateen was holed up in the nightclub after his initial assault, he called 911 to declare his terror ties. Announced and pledged his allegiance to al-Baghdadi, uh, the leader of ISIS, and also invoking the names of the Tamerlan um, Tsarnaev and the Tsarnaev brothers who were responsible for the Boston bombing. That's very significant because it uh, demonstrates, and I think it's very compelling evidence, that this is a ISIS-related terrorist attack in the United States. Late today, the ISIS propaganda news agency claimed that Mateen was an Islamic State fighter, although there was no indication that the attack was planned by ISIS. And some terror experts believe ISIS leader al-Baghdadi may have simply been taking advantage of an opportunity. This is likely to be somebody who was self-radicalized on the internet and decided on his own what the target was and when to attack it. Now FBI agents are searching for clues, looking for his phone, his computers, to figure out what may have triggered Mateen to carry out the attack. His ex-wife Satori says he was bothered by the presence of gay people. He would express, you know, um, his anger towards a certain um, culture, homosexuality, and I know at that time he was trying to get its life straight and, you know, follow his faith. And I guess that created a confusion between that and he, there was definitely moments that he would express his intolerance to homosexuals. Mateen remarried and had a three-year-old son with his second wife. Satora says she was lucky to escape alive from her marriage to him. And I'm blessed to have the family that I do because they saved me. From, from death. Sadora has now been interviewed by the FBI, which is attempting to talk to all of Mateen's family and friends. The father told reporters he believed his son became upset recently when he saw two men kissing Elizabeth. We should note that his ex-wife, who, by the way, was rescued by her own family, That's they right. actually came in and took her out took of that house of secretly. Um, but she observed no radicalized or even moderate religious tendencies while she was with him. That's right. We asked her about Al-Qaeda and ISIS. She said she didn't see anything like that at all during the time she was married to him, although she does say he was a violent man who flew off the handle easily. So a violent man while well, with her, and then we have reports that after she left and he did try to contact her, she refused all contact, that he then perhaps did begin to get perhaps radicalized, at least more observant, even taking a pilgrimage to Mecca. It was even after uh, that marriage fell apart that he began to be investigated by the FBI and was apparently telling co-workers about his connection with terrorists. And he was almost boasting about it. Uh, they investigated that and came to the conclusion that it was more a boast and not really a threat. They're certainly rethinking that tonight. Bottom line, this is what they've all feared most, the lone wolf, somebody who just has to be inspired and decide to take it into his own hands to do something absolutely horrific and hides his intentions well all right brian ross thank you so much david back to you in florida elizabeth thank you and i want to touch on something brian reported on there with our senior justice correspondent pierre thomas tonight because so many americans who have watched this unfold today are asking how can someone be interviewed by the fbi three times and then in just recent days go in to buy guns with a federal background check 
And yet there were no red flags that set off a, an FBI database somewhere, even though he'd been interviewed three times. How does this happen? David, in most cases, you could be on the terrorism watch list and still legally buy a gun. In fact, the president in a recent town hall expressed great frustration that known ISIS sympathizers could still buy guns. In the meantime, to another number you have reported on so often, you have said in your team that there are about 800 cases in this country as we stand here tonight of potential ISIS sympathizers, and yet law enforcement has to find a way to track all 800 of them. Is that even possible? David, the FBI is under tremendous pressure. Investigations in all 50 states, as you said, hundreds of people to look at. The key, who is just interested in ISIS and who will actually kill? That's the, the dilemma that they face. And right now, there's a smaller group of people that they have under 24-hour surveillance that can require dozens of agents. Under pressure, but now facing questions about how someone can be interviewed, boast of sympathizing for ISIS at work and still be able to buy guns a couple of days ago. All Indeed. Right. Here, Thomas with us tonight. Thanks so much. Elizabeth, back to you in New York. All right, David, coming up on this special edition of 2020, the ISIS connection to today's attack and its history of violence against the gay community. And as we take a break, take a look at this picture of the Freedom Tower in Lower Manhattan, built on the site of the worst terror attack ever on American soil on 9-11, Tonight, the spire is lighted in the colors of the rainbow flag. And that is the historic Stonewall Inn in New York City, a national symbol of gay rights and the gay rights movement. Now, 47 years after violence there launched that movement, people are gathering, holding a vigil for the victims of today's shooting. And the shooting at a gay nightclub as Gay Pride Month in the U.S. is just getting underway has the LGBT community understandably on edge. It is a community that has been the target of violence so many times before, but never, never anything like this. ABC's Gio Benitez is live at another Orlando club where they're holding a vigil for today's victims. Gio. Elizabeth, uh, here at this club, 1,400 people have walked through. This is the largest gay club in Orlando, and they say they are celebrating tonight because they want to show support and they want to honor those that they lost. I want to show you some video right now from just a few hours ago, a massive candlelight vigil here at this club tonight, like so many others across the nation. <laughs> What started as a night of dancing and celebration in Orlando ended as a violent attack on a prideful community and a nation. This is an especially heartbreaking day for all of our friends, our fellow Americans who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. Nearly 12 hours after the first shots were fired, the president set the tone of solidarity. This is a sobering reminder that attacks on any American, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion or sexual orientation is an attack on all of us. But sexual orientation came up again today at, of all places, blood banks in the Orlando area that received so many donations, they had to turn people away. This in spite of the existing FDA recommendation that men who have slept with men in the past 12 months not donate blood. When I tried to donate blood today, I got turned away from being gay. So I just get helpless, scared. Sad, angry. This all coming during Gay Pride Month, and nowhere was the love more on display than in Los Angeles at the nation's largest LGBT parade. Pride was interrupted for a moment of silence. And as the colorful parade continued, news emerged that this event too may have been a target of terror. This 20-year-old suspect was arrested with an arsenal of his own shortly before 5 a.m. today. And our officers were immediately uh, noticed that there was a, a rifle on the, in the seat of the car, which led to a further investigation, at which point we recovered additional firearms, uh, high-capacity magazines. Police say the investigation is continuing. We do not have any additional information related to what his intentions were. Celebrations proceeded without incident in cities like Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. And the people of Orlando are gathering tonight at the city's largest gay bar, Parliament House. Orlando is a beautiful city, and Orlando is, um, we've shown our spirit. Orlando, truthfully, is the city beautiful, and our community has come together with an enormous outpouring of love. We are left with the sounds of the Orlando Gay Chorus's rendition 
of true colors. I see your true colors, and that's why I love you. So don't be afraid to let me show, show your true colors, true colors. And we are back live now with Tim Evanicki. He's one of the managers here. And Tim, I was talking to one of your employees. He lost nine friends in that shooting. Uh, what's this like for you? Because everyone here knows somebody. That's true. It's a, such a small, tight-knit LGBT community here in Orlando. And with the number of, of dead that are coming out, we, we all know somebody. And, and we're just doing our best to support the community and all of our friends and employees in every way we can. That employee, in fact, still here at the vigil and was still there's a lot of people that are coming out here tonight because they want to celebrate life is what they're saying. Right. The Parliament House has been here for 40 years. We've been the center of the gay community here and we're always open in times of crisis for the community. And we weren't sure whether or not we were going to even do anything tonight. But the community sort of spoke to us and, and told us that they needed a place to go. So we were happy to do that. And uh, with the vigil, we decided to go ahead and do the 10 and 12 o'clock drag shows um, and it, make it as, as normal as possible. All right, Tim Evanicki, thank you so right, much for joining you. us here. Elizabeth, back to you. All right, Gio, thank you so much. It's hard to understand somebody losing nine friends this morning. ISIS, which has now claimed responsibility for today's attack, does target gay men with violent attacks. And joining me now to talk more about that is Jessica Stern, the executive director of Outright Action International and ABC's Brian Ross. There, this is such a serious issue. There was recently a, a UN Security Council meeting called to discuss just this. Mm -hmm. There are rampant accounts of ISIS rounding up gay men, charging them with debauchery and executing mm -hmm. them publicly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right, and they have set the stage both with words and actions in calling on their followers to attack gays. Uh, they've described it as the worst sin against mankind, and they have provided what they say is a legal justification to kill those sinners, kill those who are gay. And we have seen the ugly videos, the brutal stonings of gay people in Iraq and Syria, in some cases uh, executions, beheadings, even throwing gay men off the rooftops of buildings. It is actually, we, it, there, it, it's deeply, deeply disturbing, Jessica, mm. but unbelievably, it's not just ISIS mm. that are targeting and persecuting gays in mm. some of these uh, Middle Eastern countries. Mm. We've spoken to gays who've come to the United States who say their own families, they fled, they were afraid their own families would turn them into ISIS. Their families were not members of ISIS. Mm. I'm so glad you asked these questions. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think there's a couple of things to know. First of all, the men that have been executed by ISIS may not actually have identified as gay. Um, they've been accused of so-called crimes of the prophet lot. And of course, ISIS doesn't have a regular court of law where a defense attorney stands up and represents you and presents evidence of your so-called crimes. These are really arbitrary allegations that can be used against almost anyone without evidence that of any wrongdoing or, or their identities. So I think it's important to just draw a distinction. People are being persecuted for alleged acts of homosexuality, but we have no idea how they identify. And right, your... but, but people who do identify as gay are fleeing ISIS and reporting being targeted by ISIS, persecuted by ISIS, executed. And that is such an important point because ISIS is not just executing people, they're bragging about it. So my organization, Outright Action International, has documented more than 41 murders that ISIS has claimed responsibility for, for alleged acts of homosexuality since the end of 2014. And so we know whatever the justification for the executions are, ISIS has been sending a systematic message that certain people are undesirable. Which, go ahead. Actually, and it's a very ugly message that has a kind of resonance with people who want to follow ISIS, want to do something to be seen by ISIS as carrying out the caliphate. Which raises the question, was this, was Omar Mateen motivated by terrorism or hate, or both? Or both, exactly, exactly right. Uh, his father has told reporters he became upset when he recently saw uh, two men kissing. His ex-wife, as you saw, uh, said that he had a very, he was very intolerant of anyone that he deemed to be gay. It's interesting that you would say that they d term homosexuality to be the worst crime against mankind. Mm. This is a group that demonizes the United States, the Western world, women who want to be educated or perhaps even just don't want to wear a burqa. And, right, right. and and now they're they're elevating 
homosexuality is above that. This barbaric group, which probably does commit some of the worst crimes against mankind and humanity, now pointing the finger at people they deem to be gay as, as the perpetrators of these sins. All right. Jessica Stern, thank you so much for being here tonight, Brian. Thank, thank you. you for your great reporting. And when we come back, one mother's frantic search for her son and her desperate plea for us to all just get along. As we take a break, take a look at this picture from the Empire State Building going dark tonight to honor the victims of the massacre in Orlando. performing the Star Spangled Banner outside the White House in Washington today. There was a swift response from President Obama today. As we mentioned earlier in the hour, this was the 15th time he addressed the American people after a mass shooting on U.S. soil. But there were also responses from two other people, the presumed nominees for each party, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, giving the American people a glimpse at how each of them would handle this if they were elected president. Here's ABC's chief White House correspondent, Jonathan Carl, tonight. Today marks the most deadly shooting in American history. It's the 15th time the president has addressed the nation following a mass shooting here in America. A grim ritual echoed over and over again during his presidency. I hope and pray that I don't have to come out again during my tenure as president. 2009, Fort Hood. In 2011, Congresswoman Gabby Giffords gunned down in a Tucson parking lot. 2012, the horror at Sandy Hook Elementary School. The majority of those who died today were children. They had their entire lives ahead of them. Many of the shootings were crimes by deranged gunmen without any ties to terrorist groups. Many with guns bought legally. The number of people who die from gun-related incidents dwarfs any deaths that happened through terrorism. But several were inspired by radical Islamic terrorist groups like ISIS. Most recently, San Bernardino, and now, apparently, Orlando. We are united in grief, in outrage, and in resolve to defend our people. Condemnation of the violence is universal. But what to call it and how to respond has erupted into a political war. Today, Donald Trump tweeted that Obama should resign for not saying the words radical Islamic terrorism. He later hit Hillary Clinton, too, saying she should quit the race for the presidency for the same reason. Ted Cruz demanding Obama unleash the full force and fury of the American military to destroy ISIS. From Hillary Clinton, a more measured response, calling for actions to keep guns out of the hands of terrorists and criminals at home. The president called for that today, too. And we have to decide if that's the kind of country we want to be. And to actively do nothing is a decision as well. Doing nothing has been the answer to President Obama's calls on this for the last seven years. John Carl, our thanks to you. And we want everyone at home tonight to know that you have a voice in this, too. We want you to tweet us and weigh in on the conversation. Use the hashtag ABC2020. And as you heard John report there, there have been too many times to count that the president has addressed this country after a mass shooting here in Orlando, but of course, Newtown, early on in this presidency, San Bernardino, not long ago. And tonight, 2020's Deborah Roberts with the families who are still waiting, waiting for action. They're reporting shots fired outside of ORMC. Many lives were lost. Word of today's massacre rang even closer to home at this Connecticut theater, where a screening of the documentary Newtown on the horrific Sandy Hook school shootings went ahead as planned at the Greenwich International Film Festival. I would like to take this But first, a moment to, to acknowledge silence. Orlando's heartbreak. For the victims and families of today's tragedy. Is this sort of traumatizing all over again? Oh, without a doubt. When I see it start coming through, you know, my news feed, I, I stop 
like I can't, I know I'm not going to be able to handle it. I have to walk away for a minute. These two women featured in the film are all too familiar with today's nightmare. Nicole Huckley's six-year-old son Dylan was shot to death at Sandy Hook. Teacher Abby Clements hid 19 students in a coat room to keep them safe from the killer. 50 plus people are now joining this unwelcome club that you're a part of. This is insane that this club even exists. The road that they have ahead of them, it's, it's almost impossible to imagine. You're never quite whole again. I learned a lot from previous shooting victim families, Columbine, Aurora, um, to know that, you know, this is never going to be easy, um, but I'm going to find a way. Is it sort of a PTSD moment? today when you heard about these shootings? It absolutely, it just pulls the scab off the old wounds and, and, and brings you back to a place you, you really don't want to go back to. But William Begg, an ER doctor, was one of the first to treat the young victims that day. He says from experience, EMTs, nurses, doctors of Orlando may also be traumatized by the horror after the fact. We in the medical community are trained to actually compartmentalize. It's not till after you're driving home that reality sets in. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. He uh, dealt with that personal trauma by taking action, testifying before Congress, pushing for research into gun safety. As a ban on military style assault weapons. Are you more angry or hurt? Very angry because this was preventable. People need to feel the pain today, grieve for Orlando, and then tomorrow they need to get up and do something. So many families who want to make sure that their loved ones have not been forgotten. And Elizabeth, as we toss it back to you in New York, I just want to let our viewers at home know that the teams have arrived here as they now begin to take those uh, 50 bodies out of that nightclub. And it's, it's simply gut-wrenching to think that that's 50 families right there, like the families we just heard from in Deborah's report, 50 families who are now just beginning that process of realizing that they now have lost a loved one too. And authorities, they're obviously also putting out a call for space because with 50 victims, David, the coroner, the medical examiner has said he just doesn't have the space, uh, asking for help from the community in that respect. Obviously, there are lots and lots of questions about how the gunman, Omar Mateen, got those weapons that he used to conduct this attack early this morning, the, the worst attack since 9-11 on U.S. soil. He purchased the guns used in these attacks uh, just this past week, all legally, he carried a license to carry a concealed weapon because he had a job as a security guard. All this despite the fact that he was investigated three separate times by the FBI for possible terrorist links. Joining me now are former FBI agents Brad Garrett here in New York and Steve Gomez in Los Angeles. And Brad, I, I, you've got to wonder, how did this man pass three FBI inspections and then still be able to go out and buy all these guns? Because, Elizabeth, to buy a gun in this country, if you're a convicted felon, an illegal immigrant, or been adjudicated by a court as being mentally ill, that's the three disqualifiers. If you don't hit any of those categories, then you're going to be able to buy a gun. And, he, you know, he cleared all of those. So. That's the, the, the dilemma we're in. Just like people on the no-fly no list are able to purchase weapons, it's really something we've got to look at. Steve, did the FBI drop the ball in these investigations of Omar Mateen? Did they miss something? I mean, clearly they must have missed something because they went on to, to conduct this attack, this massacre. Well, exactly. The fact that he actually committed the attack means something was missed. Uh, whether it was in 2013 or 2014 in either of those investigations and the work that they did, there must have been something that they missed. And you have to think, was he prepared to commit some type of an attack in those years? And the fact that the FBI confronted him, conducted interviews with him, then caused him to delay whatever he was planning. And now, two years after the 2014 interview, he commits this attack. So we're definitely going to have to look at what occurred in those interviews and in those right. investigations. Obviously, there'll be a lot of second guessing those three uh, FBI investigations into him. Uh, Steve Gomez, Brad Garrett, thank you so much. And when we return, an interview with Omar Mateen's father.
the world now paying tribute tonight to the victims here in Orlando. Images of a candlelight vigil there at the Rome Coliseum. Just one of the many tributes around the globe. We have been talking about this so-called lone wolf who went into this nightclub overnight and inflicted his horror on so many people, Omar Mateen. We know that he was a U.S. citizen. He was born in New York. His parents were from Afghanistan. And tonight, his father has just given his first on-camera interview to ABC's Lindsay Janis. Why did you decide to speak with us tonight? Because uh, this is something that affects everybody. It's affecting everybody in, in the United States. And I love my uh, American brother and sister. And this news it wasn't easy to hear. I wish there was something I could have done if I knew about it. As far as this news goes, I know as much as you do. So uh, I'm really saddened and I'm really surprised. Today was a very hard day for you. Can you take us through the moments when you learned about what had happened, that your son had killed all of these people? Yeah, it was uh, 4 o'clock in the morning. I received a call and I had to go rush going to my uh, daughter's house. And they told me about the news. And they said, well, we cannot tell you anything until we make sure that we get the right news. So we were waiting a few hours until the news came out. And I couldn't believe that was my son because my son got enough education. He's born in the United States in New York. And he finished high school here in Florida. And he got his associate degree in criminal justice. And he had a lot of love and care. And I couldn't believe that this is what he was doing. And if he was alive, I would ask him one question. Why? Do you have any idea why he might have done this? I wish I had. That's what I said. He surprised me because I didn't see anything irregular with him. When was the last time you saw him? I saw him yesterday uh, afternoon. You saw him yesterday afternoon? Afternoon came in here, paid respect, and you went. Did like around three o'clock. Unusual? No, everything was normal. Everything was normal. Was he radicalized in any way? Did he have sympathies with ISIS? He's, he wasn't because he had no beard. And he was a just a regular person going to work, coming back, and take care of his uh, wife and his kids. Omar Mateen's father.